Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 256 of Manage the Wild. I'm your host, Nick Madsen. Today, we're going to be talking about winter feed sites, uh, winter feeding animals. Yes, it's that time of year again. It sucks. The snow is back. I have PTSD from last year, and here we are. Find ourselves in snow again. It's almost like it's yearly. I don't know. So, winter feed sites uh, I've talked about in the past, especially feeding mule deer. It's a no-no. There's a whole bunch of effects that you should do. So, why are we actively feeding elk? Why are multiple states actively feeding elk if they're if there's no good? They spread disease. They alter migration. They change the timing of when animals are migrating to and when they are migrating from. And there's just a whole host of problems. Why are we doing it? Uh, main issue is depredation. That's one of the main issues that a lot of states face is elk coming to haystacks can demolish it in a night. They are destructive. Uh, you come across an unprotected hay site and they can have the whole thing torn down in a night, just ripping it with their antlers, pawing at it, tipping stacks over. Uh, there's been multiple situations where I've been called in and had to remove uh, a one-ton bale off a cow elk, got killed and crushed because they just tipped the stack over. And so one of the best ways that you can keep elk from coming into ranches and farms and competing with cows and tearing down haystacks is to set up these winter feed sites away from those areas. You're effectively keeping them from moving down into the valleys, creating problems. There is a public safety factor that goes into win win winter feeding sites as well. Uh, by having elk move down lower into these valleys where a lot of people are, obviously that puts them in direct contact with the elk. You're going to have people being trampled or chased. You're also going to have car wrecks, car accidents, and those type of things. And so you're pulling them away from those areas as well. Last year, uh, across the news, was multiple videos of elk trying to cross a freeway in Utah. They ended up using an area as a feed site. They talked a rancher into feeding elk. He pulled them a couple of miles away from that road, fed them until basically May, the end of April, and he kept those elk from wanting to cross onto the freeway. That's another challenge we have is we've uh, cut off the corridors for these elk to move from different locations based upon where we have set up our cities and our roadways. That creates a challenge. Another possible winter feed site reason why you would set one up is you have a lot of animals dying. Last year we saw it. We had a lot of bulls, uh, 60, 60, over 60 bulls, as well as cows and calves, but it was famous because of all the bulls dead on the hillside that people were driving by and seeing these dead elk laying everywhere. So you can set up uh, feed sites for them uh, to reduce some of the effects of the winter. Uh, overall, when all that is said and done, because that's reactionary, uh, when you're coming into spring, that's when you need to start deciding, is our habitat good enough, not good enough? What do we need to do? Let's say you have great habitat, you're doing everything you can, but you still have depredation, you set up these feed sites. The challenge is winter feed sites spread disease. One of the couple of the main concerns in our neck of the woods is chronic wasting disease as well as brucellosis. Uh, we currently don't have uh, CWD in the area that I'm at. It's not too far away, about 50 miles south. It's been uh, discovered. Um, and brucellosis is in Wyoming and Idaho, uh, but not currently where we are at. And that's one of the main issues, um, especially for ranchers in the ag industry. If elk that have it in Wyoming and Idaho bring it into the state of Utah, that's going to change how the ag industry does their business. So they're really focused on that. We're looking at it because brucellosis causes cows to abort a feed, their fetuses. And that's not good if you want to grow your elk population. So they are looking at it then. And there's a study that I currently have open that says that fed elk have a high uh, prevalence of brucellosis within them. And now it's become self-sustaining in unfed herds too. 
So you got a challenge. The question is, what do you focus on? Depredation versus disease. Now, if we had CWD in this area and we had brucellosis, you're going to have a lot different conversation. Uh, you're going to spread those animals out as far as possible. You're just going to deal with the depredation. You're going to hire more technicians. You're going to push those animals off of the feed sites. You're going to be spending a lot of time at night in the dark with cracker shells, M80s, firecrackers chasing those animals away because winter feed sites are going to make it much more difficult. If you have a population of elk coming in and a couple of them have brucellosis and then they start spreading because they don't all go to the same location, they go to different locations and now you start to spread brucellosis, CWD, everywhere else. But I'm going to show you some cool videos. These are some videos that were taken a few years ago. Uh, I helped with a project. The vet for the state of Utah was looking at the difference between the elk coming into feed sites versus the ones that we were getting in the traps. Uh, normally we saw a lot of the same cows and calves coming into the traps and so she wanted to look at the difference between the animals themselves. Uh, what did they look like? How was their overall health? Now, I don't know how this whole study played out. I don't know if she ever finished her paper or not, but it was fun to be able to sit here as they went around and they fed all these elk, and then these elk would start feeding around me. Um, we'd wait till the vet determined which cow or calf she wanted to dart, and then we would dart it, and then we would move in and take samples. Uh, here's one. So we have taken all our samples from this cow. We've pulled everything and now we have done a reversal on the drugs. We have given it another drug that counteracts the effects of the one we give it. And we are waiting for this cow to just pop up and run away. Oftentimes people think that it's like in instantaneous they drop and instantaneous they're back up. And that's just not the effect. Uh, that's just not the way it happens. Sometimes you're five minutes before the the cow or the calf or whatever it is goes down, depending on the animal and how much adrenaline it has running through it. But uh, it was fun to be able to go through and work with the state in doing all the different studies and tests that we were doing. So the question is, what do you focus on, disease or depredation? That's a toughie. I don't know. I guess personally, I would probably... Depredation is seasonal. Uh, it doesn't take very long. It does affect people, um, but it doesn't take very long. You know, you have a few months or, uh, or a few weeks or even in sometimes months of depredation, and you can combat that by coming out and hazing at night where disease... It's, you can't get rid of disease. I'm more on reducing the amount of feed sites and keeping those animals separated into the groups themselves, having things more natural. Uh, the more we spread disease, the more it gets in populations and it's difficult to deal with. So that's all I got for today. Hope you guys have a great day. Stay wild.